Welcome to Mindful School Marketing, your go-to podcast for personal and professional growth. We're school marketers, business owners, and moms passionate about connecting other school professionals with tools and strategies for success. We love solving problems, exploring new ideas, and thinking outside the box. Let's transform your school and life starting right now. Transform your school's admissions and marketing with Inquiry Tracker, the ultimate solution for managing inquiries seamlessly. Discover how you can make your admissions process more efficient and effective with this leading solution. Welcome to Mindful School Marketing. I'm Tara Claves. And I'm Aubrey Bursch. Today, we're joined by Terry Dubow. Terry serves as Director of Communications and Story at Marin Montessori School in California. He has worked at various independent schools around the country, from Ohio to New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and now California. He earned a bachelor's degree in English at Skidmore College and his master's in journalism at the Ohio State University. A middle and high school English teacher for more than 20 years, he also served in various administrative roles from the Director of Communications at Hathaway Brown to the Associate Head of School at Westtown. His most recent work focused on helping launch the Mastery Transcript Consortium and the Mastery School of Hawken. Welcome, Terry. We're so excited you're here on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thrilled to be here. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's great to have you join us. We came across a blog post that you wrote with Brendan Schneider, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. But first of all, I also love your title, the Director of Communications yeah, and Story. Took, what a took great some time title. figuring that one out. So yeah. It's a great title. Love it. But before we dive in, can you just tell us a little bit more than about yourself that you'd like to share maybe that wasn't in your formal bio? Sure. I think the I've had a very interesting circuitous route to where whatever I'm doing. Um we're in Montessori right now. Um I, I'm an English teacher. I started um, working in, in uh, junior highs in Pennsylvania. In fact, you probably know Rob Norman. Um, from turn around, yeah. So Rob and Liza's daughter and son were some of my first students at Newtown Friends School in Pennsylvania. So I've known that as that family forever. I house sat for them during spring break as a 23 year old. So I've been, so I've just been around schools for a long time. I taught middle school and high school English writing. I ran a writing center. So I just of the faculty. And then I, I found my way. I was at Halfway Brown, which is a school that is still very, very uh, dear to my heart. And I got uh, very close with the head of school, Bill Christ. And he took a shot at me. And I said I wanted to try something so, uh, more administrative because I was, I've been around schools for long enough. Um, and uh, he let me be the director of communications without a lot of like direct training and how to do it. And I fumbled my way through it and then found my way. So I'd come from faculty, but then I moved through a communications but also through a strategic work. So I was been director of strategic projects and things like that at schools. So I, and I think maybe in my strange path, I have a distinct view of schools and perspective. That's really cool that you've had all those roles and can see the different perspectives and the different um, ways people work within schools. Yeah, uh, it makes it hard for a resume though. Less people are like, what is he? And what does he do? I don't think, I can't, like, a lot of jobs have closed off for me because my resume doesn't make, it's just not clear enough. So it goes. Yeah. So there must be pluses and minuses. But from what I, I think it's a really interesting perspective you have. And especially it came through when when we read Unmarking Schools, which is the blog post that you wrote on Brendan Schneider's blog. I think it was really interesting the things that you discussed about there, where you talked about school marketing, school marketers, faculty storytelling, and so much more. I'd love for you to share with our audience a little bit more about what the article covered and why it came to be, like from your experience in schools. Yeah. So I yeah, but thanks for reading it. And you never know when you turn things out of the internet. But I had just observed in the day in this business for a bit, like that a lot of, this, there are a lot of websites and market materials that I really admire. And I have two kids that went through the college process and I love their, all those things. I'm a big fan of it. I'm not a critic at all. I love it. But one thing I noticed is that a lot of schools highlight really exciting things about their program that anybody would want in their right mind. And that's great. But my hunch is that what I've noticed is that it also doesn't necessarily move people who aren't necessarily in the marketplace or aren't sure they wanted to join. And we have a shrinking demographic of people who can afford these schools. So if you're only marketing people who are like really deciding between one school's climbing wall and another school's climbing wall, then great. But most people aren't that. Most people have to be persuaded that this is a valuable investment. Um, and not just for the sort of typical ROI, like they get them to Stanford or something like that, but it is actually going to do something. I 
I think a lot about audience. And one of the things I noticed is that uh, most schools, when they talk about themselves, they talk about themselves. And what I encourage people is to stop talking to yourself. Talk about your parents, talk about the kids and then not just how cool they are and interesting they are, but what are their needs? I think some of my advantage, despite my strange and unusual path is that I, one of the classes I've taught for 20 years is a class called media literacy, which unpacks uh, the role of popular culture and, and news on our society and not always a happy story. But anyway, I encountered a guy named Edward Bernays, um, when I was teaching that class and, uh, He's not a, he's not a hero, uh, at all. Um, he was the nephew of Sigmund Freud and he, uh, took some of his uncle's insights into human psychology and applied it to consumerism. Um, and so a lot of what we get now is all originated from him. And so what did he, he exploited people's emotions, um, their latent unspoken feelings and fears and anxieties. Um, and he got us to buy stuff we didn't need and he got us to change our attitudes and our values and all kinds of things. It's a long game, but he did a good job in a terrible way. I take that insight and just try to think about how, um, what are the anxieties and aspirations parents have around schools, around their children, about raising kids today, and think of first about what would drive someone to make a choice. And then think about our programs and how those programs can respond to those anxieties and aspirations. So that's a long way of saying that's what I write in that article. <laughs> Yeah, it's a compelling title to, on marketing, right? What is on marketing? Is I also say I'm, I don't make a lot of friends with this because it is an orthodox approach and do no, because, and I get it. It works for some schools, like really beautiful stuff, the uh, view books and the websites and the videos and all. It's very emotionally compelling. I, I'd love my kid to go there. But when it comes down to a, like I, Marin Montessori is a toddler through ninth grade kid school, right? So you're looking at, 30 grand to 40 grand for nine years before you get to high school, before you get to college. Having a beautiful view and a nice jungle gym is not enough. Like it's got to speak to something deep and, it, and you have to align yourself with parents. So that's my philosophy. I really appreciate you speaking to this because a lot of times, yeah, you're like, this has a better climbing gym than the school down the street, right? Like you were talking about earlier. So yeah, I think it's understanding parents as you said, their fears, like understanding their words, like what are their worries? Why, what would make them want to send their child here? It's usually something like a fear or a concern or an alternative that they're not willing to embrace. So once you understand that, that can help you understand, is your school the best fit for them? And then how do you talk about it? You too? talk about it. Yeah. 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 So I think that's the one sort of, I think, insight that might be useful to other schools. I think it's hard work to really do that kind of research and to test it, to see if you're right. You have to talk to parents. You have to do, I do a lot of focus groups. I am just trying to get in there. And the other thing that the article talks about is just the role of faculty in this is so essential because they know why parents are worried. They know when they make a connection with a family that is rock solid and that builds this trust bank that is really essential to build the sense of that the school is invaluable to a family. Like the parents, the teachers are doing it every day. And most, I've been at schools where the marketers, like they're like the CFO back in an office. They've never, they don't go into a classroom. They don't know anything about education really. They can come from an insurance company or something or, which is fine. I don't mean to be critical, but it's just like the schools are like very strange and wonderful places and so your faculty know this stuff. So aligning with your faculty and knowing them yeah. Talking to them is really important too. Yeah, I think that's a really key point. I want to dive into that a little bit. Probably nobody would disagree with that statement, but how do you actually do that, right? Like how does a school marketer, if they're listening to this, what's the best way to go about getting that faculty input? Is it just sitting down with them once? Is it a regular touch base every month? What kind of, what do you recommend as a process? First thing I would say is that faculty are people too. And they have their own fears, uh, anxieties, and aspirations. And one of the things that if you talk to teachers long enough and you get them the next talk, one of the things they will often say is that they can feel invisible, that they don't feel seen. That, and there are things, amazing things they're doing that just go past everybody. Even the director of the program might not know what's happening. And the only people who know about it are the kids in the class and sometimes their parents. One of the things that I've always tried to do is like find platforms for showcasing the work of faculty and, and students. And 
people respond very well if they feel seen. At Hathaway Brown, when I was in charge of the alumni magazine, like the, one of the first things we did with the redesign is did a, with just a, a, the whole thing on faculty, did a big photo shoot, did all that sort of stuff. They appreciate it. Then I hopefully will have a chance I can talk more about the sort of second websites I always, I've made a couple for a couple of schools, but I, I, this, we're, we're, we're in Montessori. We made a new site called Grounded and Soaring. And it's a separate site I'm talking about why we did a second site, but basically it's a content hub. So it has podcasts and it has blog posts and it has what I call featured projects and video. Um, and it gives them a platform for, to highlight what faculty are doing. And I will go in and I will help them write the article. I got a stipend. I got a fund. I took some of my advertising budget and reallocated it for stipends and pay them to be on the podcast or pay them to help write a, po a, a blog post. They appreciate that. And it also elevates their work, gives them a, a platform. And so I'll give a quick example. I, this, a teacher at Marin had this great, it's a monastery school, so there's a lot of student agency and students doing uh, interesting things. And these two boys were really interested in elephant seals. We're in a great part of California. They're elephant seals not too far away. And so they do this thing in Montessori education called the going out, where they basically structure a time to go out and they have to coordinate the van driving and they got to do the, the, the map and they, and the teacher stays way back and the kids do a thing. They're doing a science thing and they paint, made it a pay, a, painted a, a drawing or something like that. And she was telling me this, I don't know when, over lunch or I don't know, that CPR training or something. I was like, Hey, let's write an article. I don't have time to write an article. I'll come sit down. I'll talk to you. So she talked for 40 minutes and it was meandering. I was like, you know what? Pause. We're going to your computer. We're going to hit Google, make a Google document go to voice record and just talk into the computer. Just tell the whole story to the computer. It'll voice to text it. It will come out with this big block of text and then share it with me and I will turn it into a story. And we did. She did that. I did it. It took a couple drafts back and forth, got some photos, wrote this thing, pu published it, promoted it on the social media channels and the newsletter. And that made her feel so seen. And it was incredible content because it was actually you see what's happening. Why you would invest money in this school is because of that kind of experience. And there's no way of really an alumni magazine that you spend 30 grand on to publish. Like you're not getting that story. That took time, but it wasn't any money. And um, it was really valuable experience. So that's a long-winded way of an example of what you could do. That's so interesting. I've so, first of all, my kids are in a Montessori school, so I'm all familiar with the going out. Thanks for highlighting them. It's so interesting what you were saying about Potentially, what I'm hearing is find how you can make it easiest to collect that information from faculty, right? You're like, what's the easiest path? If they're not going to write it, can we voice memo it? Can they sit with us and we take notes, we video them or something like that? And then also, it was interesting what you said about paying them because that is an interesting, like that makes perfect sense. If you're taking part of your budget and you're saying, okay, uh, let's reward them for the work that they're doing. It doesn't become just one more thing we're putting on faculty's plates already full plate, I should say. Yeah. So a very interesting concept. So thanks so much for sharing like with that. Podcasting too, tool is so valuable too. I mean, like it's not an expensive enterprise. It takes some work, but so I made this podcast ground and soaring and, and I always try and find topics that aren't promotional. That's the other thing I would say here in this sort of meandering conversation is like, stop promoting. Like I, I was, stop promoting. Instead, talk about stories that are, tell stories that are answering the anxieties that parents have. So they, I observed a math class up in the junior high and these teachers were doing this cool thing that is very Montessori, right? They had all mixed age groups, they had two teachers and they were responding to each kid. And in some ways it was like, this is what the mastery school was trying, is trying to do in mastery movement. It's trying to be individualized and follow kids' curiosities. So I just invited them onto the podcast. And so I, and the topic wasn't like how great our math program is. The topic was like, how do you teach math in, in a world filled with math anxiety and distraction? And these guys were the experts, the teachers were the experts and they showcased their work, but it wasn't, it wasn't directly promotional. And that's the other thing I think is a valuable sort of tweak in how schools generally do things. Oh, you're on mute. Sorry. I love that, especially the math, because we always say, how do you make your kid not hate math? And that's so important because a lot of us have grown up with negative things around math. So yeah, um, I would encourage people to listen to that episode because it, it, for a lot of reasons, as an example, but it does talk about that and having the teachers be the voice of it. Mm -hmm. So interesting. Thanks so much for sharing. 
I'm curious, what do you think, as you've worked on these strategies within schools, what do you think the biggest challenge is for schools who are thinking about integrating some of these concepts? It's unorthodox. And so people have resistance to change. There's, I've certainly faced that in every school and it can feel risky and it can feel like more work. It's cheaper to spend. I've spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on advertising. I've done hundreds of thousands of direct mail. That's easy. It's expensive, but it's easier exchanging money for labor and intrusion and change, right? So I spend less and change more. And that some places would rather just spend more and change less. So I think that's a challenge. And it's also requires a reimagining of the relationship between program and what parents are worried about. So this is another controversial thing I, I say sometimes, so which is that uh, I think that the person in my job should be at the table when, uh, with the uh, program leaders. Um, not just to capture what they're doing, but to give some insight, like, hey, if we did it this way, if, for example, one of the things that's happened in our school is that there's all kinds of really wonderful things happening in our elementary program, but they're not nested under anything. And so parents don't really know about them or see them, and they don't see how they're coordinated in this really deliberate way. And so I come up with language, like, what do you call them, like, the capstone experiences and they, that's the nesting language. And we have all these different elements inside of them. You don't necessarily have to change anything, but we talked about them differently and not every level director is all that interested in that kind of partnership. I'm fortunate that at Lynn Montessori, they are, and certainly at Hawken, that was a big deal when we were doing the master program. So I think that is a, that's a major challenge. I said the market, the person in my role that it, it has to really connect with and, and be a in conversation with the program leaders. Yeah, I can see how that might be a, an uphill battle in some cases. It's just not the way, the natural way that people think about this. That's what maybe the unmarketing concept comes in. But let's say that listeners of this episode are on board and you're super motivated and you're passionate. So I think you can, people can pick up the value of what you're talking about. But what's a strategy that they can start with in preparation for, let's say, the next school year in terms of implementing this philosophy and passing it through the system in their school, whether they have a board or a head of school or someone that they need to work with to get this message across? I suppose they could share this episode with them. But what's it? What's a strategic approach? Yeah. I think the, I'd always try to work backwards. I wouldn't necessarily think about what website you're going to build or what your message is. I would start talking to parents and I would start talking to faculty around this idea of anxieties and aspirations. Like what is really underneath it that is driving people to make this choice to come and to stay? When faculty talk to parents who are like, who are true believers, why are they here? When fat, when you have attrition issues, I did a big exit interview this summer. Like I just talked to them, like, why'd you leave? And those conversations. They'll talk to me. I'm like, I'm anonymous. So they always be like, they'll tell me things. And it's really helpful because it can tell us like, okay, so we think that they're here because of X, but they're actually, but they, and they may have came for, they come for X, but then they leave for Y. That's really important. So what can we do? Not just like, what kind of language can we use, but what programmatically can we do to understand it? Because we're not addressing the same anxiety they're having. And sometimes it's just very pragmatic and sometimes it's more philosophical. And so you got to, the first thing to do is just to talk and then to listen. You got to listen. And I have, it's always hard to listen. It's easier said than done, but try to also hold, withhold your assumptions of what they're going to say and, and just really try to pay attention. I love that. That's so important. We do a lot of research like this for schools because it, it's important to understand where the parents are coming from. And sometimes even the students, if you're, you have upper grades as well, yeah. to understand like why they came, why they stayed, why they're leaving. And then like just hearing and listening to them about, about your school can help inform so much of what you're saying here today. So yep. I appreciate you bringing that up. I'd like to switch a little bit to, sure. as with this podcast, it, we talk about mindfulness. It's a mindful school marketing podcast and how it applies to working in schools. How do you see mindfulness in relation to your role in schools and also in relation to this topic? I think the idea of listening is also about quieting yourself, right? I think that the, the part of what I, so I also, like, I'm a writer guy. So like I write stories and things like that. And so most of what that act is just staying quiet and separating 
your ego from the world that's that you're encountering so that you can be open to absorbing it. That that's a sort of, I don't know if it's natural, but certainly that's yeah, something I've cultivated is trying to pay, to be, be quiet. I also just as a practical thing, like I, there are lots of times where I just turn off everything when I drive, we've got San Francisco is great, but there's traffic. And so all my 15 mile drive can be 50 minutes. So there are lots of times where I'll just turn off everything and just li- and be quiet. And that's helpful. It helps me with work. If I'm thinking about something I'm trying to accomplish or what I'm writing or things, but you know, shutting up and listening is pretty good advice. Yes, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. We are going to move into our rapid fire questions now. So these are fun. So we're going to start with my favorite. If you could put one book as mandatory reading in the high school curriculum, what would it be? Uh, I, I, this was the easy one for me. It's called Amusing Ourselves to Death by Neil Postman, 1982, I think. It's a bit of sociology and criticism of what he was seeing in how culture was changing. And now it's this quaint little book about how bad TV was in the 19, early 70s to the 80s and how it was changing people's minds. But now I always, in my, when I teach this class, I always have them write the, the next chapter about today. And yeah, it's a really powerful book and it, and it holds up. Thanks so much for sharing. We'll add it to our Goodreads list too. So yeah. our listeners yeah, can find it. It's not a fun read, but it's a good read. That's great. I, my children are young, so you can imagine as we run this podcast, how many books I have now lined up for them to read before high sure. school. <laughs> so next question, what is one app you couldn't live without? I really like all trails. We do a lot of hiking around here and it's pretty powerful. My wife has a tendency of just thinking she knows where we're going and we get lost. So now I can like, now I can show her which way to go. <laughs> but yeah, I love all trails. Yeah, I love it. I, I'm a huge fan. Yeah. Awesome. What are you reading right now? i uh, reading a book called The Rabbit Hutch, the novel that's going to win a bunch of awards. I try to read, I, I, I'm honest, I read fiction more than anything else. I, I try and stay clear of all the other stuff because I like the stories. Thank you. What is one great piece of advice you'd like to leave us with? So I've thought about this. I think I'm going to try and articulate this clearly. I think the piece of advice is like that organizational principles really matter. What I mean by that is what you organize around will in some ways determine both the structure of what you create and the results. More specifically, like if you organize around your school, it's going, you're going, and when you do this kind of work, like you're going to say, eventually say certain kinds of things. But if you organize around your audience, you'll say different things. And, and I think that'll lead to different results. So thinking about your organizational principles are really important. And I often, like, I will always talk about this when I'll talk to the head of school or something like that, and he wants to talk about X. Let's organize it around this parental anxiety. We can end up talking about X, but it's much better. It'll be more effective. It's it's we already know what that, what X is solving for parents. So that's, I would, that's my piece of advice. Great. Thank you so much. You've shared such great ideas with us today. I'm excited to get this out there for our listeners. Where can people find you online, Terry? All my Instagram stuff is just pictures of my kids. So I would just do LinkedIn, look for Terry DeBell on LinkedIn, or you can Google me. I will say that one thing, if you Google me, which I, I have Googled myself, I will admit that. There is someone named Terry Dubrow, who's a very famous plastic surgeon of the stars. There's a lot of content that I don't really affiliate with on there, but if you Google me, you'll see, you'll find my stories and all that other stuff I do. Excellent. Thank you, Terry. All right. Thanks for joining us, Terry. Have a great day. This episode is brought to you by Enquiry Tracker. We believe that every inquiry is an opportunity. And with Enquiry Tracker, you can unlock the full potential of your school's enrollment journey. Say goodbye to missed opportunities and hello to a streamlined admissions process that prioritizes efficiency and effectiveness. Discover the leading solution for school admissions and marketing. Visit inquirytracker.net to book a personalized demo today. That's inquiry with an E, tracker.net. Thanks for joining us on the Mindful School Marketing Podcast. We'd love it if you pop into iTunes and leave a review, five star preferred. Let us know how you like the show. It helps us improve what we're doing and helps others find us too.